Chapter 3. Dragon Tales At dawn, the sun's rays streamed through the window, warming Aragon's face. Rubbing his eyes, he sat up on the edge of the bed. The pine floor was cold under his feet. He stretched his store sore legs and rubbed his back, yawning. Beside the bed was a row of shelves covered with objects he had collected. There were twisted pieces of wood, odd bits of shells, rocks that had been broken to reveal shiny exteriors, interiors, and strips of dry grass tied into knots. His favorite item was a root so convoluted he never tired of looking at it. The rest of the room was bare, except for a small dresser and nightstand. He pulled on his boots and stared at the floor, thinking. This was a special day. It was near this very hour, sixteen years ago, that his mother, Selina, had come home to Carvajal alone and pregnant. She had, not, she had been gone for six years, living in the cities. When she returned, she wore expensive clothes and her hair was bound by a net of pearls. She had sought out her brother, Garrow, and asked to stay with him until the baby arrived. Within five months, her son was born. Everyone was shocked when Selina tearfully begged Garrow and Marion to raise him. When they asked why, she only wept and said, I must. Her pleas had grown increasingly desperate until they finally agreed. She named him Aragon, then departed early the next morning and never returned. Aragon still remembered how he had felt when Marion told him the story before she died. The realization that Garrow and Marion were not his real parents had disturbed him greatly. Things that had been permanent and unquestionable were suddenly thrown into doubt. Eventually he had learned to live with it, but he always had a nagging suspicion that he had not been good enough for his mother. I'm sure there was a good reason for what she did. I only wish I knew what it was. One other thing bothered him. Who was his father? Selina had told no one, and whoever it might be had never come looking for Aragon. He wished he knew who it was, if only to have a name. It would be nice to know his heritage. He sighed and went to the nightstand, where he splashed his face, shivering as the water ran down his neck. Refreshed, he retrieved the stone from under the bed and set it on a shelf. The morning light caressed it, throwing a warm shadow on the wall. He touched it one more time, then hurried to the kitchen, er eager to see his family. Garrow and Rorin were already there, eating chicken. As Aragon greeted them, Rorin stood with a friend, with a grin. Rorin was two years older than Aragon, muscular, sturdy, and careful with his movements. They could not have been closer, even if they had been real brothers. Rorin smiled. I'm glad you're back. How was the trip? Hard, replied Aragon. Did Uncle tell you what happened? He helped himself to a piece of chicken, which he devoured hungrily. No, said Rorin, and the story was quickly told. At Rorin's insistence, Aragon left his food to show him the stone. This elicited a satisfactory amount of awe, but Rorin soon asked nervously, Were you able to talk with Katrina? No, there wasn't an opportunity after the, after the argument with Sloane, but she'll expect you when the traitors come. I gave the message to Horst. He will get it to her. You told Horst? said Rorin incredulously. That was private. If I wanted everyone to know about it, I could have built a bonfire and used smoke signals to communicate. If Sloane finds out, he won't let me see her again. Horst will be discreet, assured Aragon. He won't let anyone fall prey to Sloane, least of all you. Rorin seemed unconvinced, but argued no more. They returned to their meals in the taciturn presence of Garrow. When the last bites were finished, all three went to work in the fields. The sun was cold and pale, providing little comfort. Under its watchful eye, the last of the barley was stored in the barn. Next, they gathered prickly vine squash, then the rutabagas, beets, peas, turnips, and beans, which they packed in the root cellar. After hours of labor, they stretched their cramped muscles, pleased that the harvest was finished. The following days were spent pickling, salting, shelling, and preparing the food for winter. Nine days after Aragon's return, a vicious blizzard blew out of the mountains and settled over the valley. The snow came down in great sheets, blanketing the countryside in white. They only dared leave the house for firewood and to feed the animals, for they feared getting lost in the howling wind and featureless landscape. They spent their time huddled over the stove as gusts rattled the heavy window shutters. Days later, the storm finally passed, revealing an alien world of soft white drifts. I'm afraid the traders may not come this year with conditions this bad, said Garrow. They're late as it is. We'll give them a chance and wait before going to Carvajal. But if they don't show soon, we'll have to buy any spare supplies from the townspeople. His countenance was resigned. They grew anxious as the days crept by without sign of the traders. Talk was sparse, and depression hung over the house. 
On the eighth morning, Warren walked to the road and confirmed that the traders had not yet passed. The day was spent readying for the trip into Carvajal, scrounging with grim items, grin, gr f scrounging with grim expressions for saleable items. That evening, out of desperation, Aragon checked the road again. He found deep ruts cut into the snow, with numerous hoof prints between them. Elated, he ran back to the house whooping, bringing new life to their preparations. They packed their surplus produce into the wagon before sunrise. Garrow put the year's money in a leather pouch that he carefully fastened to his belt. Aragon set the wrapped stone between bags of grain so it would not roll when the wagon hit bumps. After a hasty breakfast, they har harnessed the horses and cleared a path to the road. The traders' wagons had already broken the drifts, which sped their progress. By noon, they could see Carvajal. In daylight, it was a small, earthy village filled with shouts and laughter. The traders had made camp in an empty field on the outskirts of town. Groups of wagons, tents, and fires were randomly spread across it, spots of color against the snow. The troubadours' four tents were garishly decorated. A steady stream of people linked the camp to the village. Crowds churned around a line of bright tents and booths clogging the main street. Horses whinnied at the noise. The snow had been pounded flat, giving it a glassy surface. Elsewhere, bonfires had melted it. Roasted hazelnuts added a rich aroma to the smells wafting around them. Garrow parked the wagon and picketed the horses, then drew coins from his pouch. Get yourself some treats. Roran, do what you want. Only be at horse in time for supper. Aragon, bring that stone and come with me. Aragon grinned at Roran and pocketed the money, already planning how to spend it. Roran departed immediately with a determined expression on his face. Garrow led Aragon into the throng, shouldering his way through the bustle. Women were buying clo cloth, while nearby their husbands examined a new latch, hook, or tool. Children ran up and down the road, shrieking with excitement. Knives were displayed here, spices there, and pots were laid out in shiny rows next to leather harnesses. Aragon stared at the traders curiously. They seemed less prosperous than last year. Their children had a frightened, worried look, and their clothes were patched. The gaunt men carried swords and daggers with new familiarity, and even the women had ponyards belted at their waists. What could have happened to make them like this? And why are they so late? wondered Aragon. He remembered the traders as being full of good cheer, but there was none of that now. Garrow pushed down the street, searching for Merlock, a trader who specialized in odd trinkets and pieces of jewelry. They found him behind the booth, displaying brooches to a group of women. women. As each new piece was revealed, exclamations of adorations followed. Aragon guessed that more than a few purses would soon be depleted. Murloc seemed to flourish and, every time him, and grow every time his wares were complimented. He wore a goatee, held himself with ease, and seemed to regard the rest of the world with slight contempt. The excited group prevented Garrow and Aragon from getting near the traitor, so they settled on a step and waited. As soon as Murloc was unoccupied, they hurried over. "'And what might you, sirs, want to look at?' asked Murloc. "'An amulet or a trinket for a lady?' With a twirl, he pulled out a delicately carved silver robed rose of excellent workmanship. The polished metal caught Aragon's attention, and he eyed it appreciatively. The trader continued, "'Not even three crowns, though it has come all the way from the famed craftsmen of Belladonna.' Gero spoke in a quiet voice. "'We aren't looking to buy, but to sell.' Merlaki immediately covered the rose and looked at them with new interest. Oh, "'I see. Maybe, if this item is of any value, you would like to trade it for one or two of these exquisite pieces.' He paused for a moment while Aragon and his uncle stood uncomfortably, and then continued, "'You did bring the object of consideration?' "'We have it, but we'd rather show it to you elsewhere,' said Garrow in a firm voice. Murloc raised an eyebrow, but spoke smoothly. "'In that case, let me invite you to my tent.' He gathered up his wares and gently laid them in an iron-bound chest, which he locked. He then ushered them up the street and into the temporary camp. They wound between the wagons to a tent removed from the rest of the traders. It was crimson at the top and sable at the bottom, with thin triangles of color stabbing into each other. Murloc untied the opening and swung the flap to one side. Small trinkets and strange pieces of furniture, such as a round bed and three seats carved from tree stumps, filled the tent. A gnarled dagger with a ruby in the pommel rested on a white cushion. Murloc closed the flap and said to them, "'Please seat yourself.' When they had, he said, "'Now show me why we are meeting in private.' 
Aragon unwrapped the stone and set it between the two men. Murloc reached for it with a gleam in his eye, then stopped and asked, May I? When Garrow indicated his approval, Murloc picked it up. He put the stone in his lap and reached to one side for a thin box. Opening it, it revealed, opening, opened, it revealed a large set of copper scales, which he set on the ground. After weighing the stone, he scrutinized its surface under a jeweler's glass, tempted it, tapped it gently with a wooden mallet, and drew the point of a tiny clear stone over it. He measured its length and diameter, then recorded the figures on a slate. He considered the results for a while. Do you know what this is worth? No, admitted Garrow. His cheek twitched, and he shifted uncomfortably on the seat. Murlock grimaced. Unfortunately, neither do I. But I can tell you this much. The white veins are the same material as the blue that surrounds them, only a different color. What that material might be, though, I haven't a clue. It's harder than any rock I have seen. Harder even than diamond. Whoever shaped it used tools I have never seen, or magic. Also, it's hollow. What? Is exclaimed Garrow. An irritated edge crept into Murloc's voice. Did you ever hear a rock sound like this? He grabbed the dagger from the cushion and slapped the stone with the flat of the blade. A pure note filled the air, then faded away smoothly. Aragon was alarmed, afraid the stone had been damaged. Murloc tilted the stone towards them. You will find no scratches or blemishes where the dagger struck. I doubt I could do anything to harm this stone, even if I took a hammer to it. Garrow crossed his arms with a reserved expression. A wall of silence surrounded him. Aragon was puzzled. I knew that the stone appeared in them spined through magic, but made by magic? What for and why? He blurted. But what is it worth? I can't tell you that, said Murloc in a pained voice. I am sure there are people who would pay dearly to have it, but none of them are in Carvajal. You would have to go to the southern cities to find a buyer. This is a curiosity for most people, not an item to spend money on when practical things are needed. Garrow stared at the tent ceiling like a gambler calculating the odds. Will you buy it? The trader answered instantly. It's not worth the risk. I might be able to find a wealthy buyer during my spring travels, but I can't be certain. Even if I did, you wouldn't be paid until I return next year. No, you will have to find someone else to trade with. I am curious, however. Why did you insist on talking to me in private? Aragon put the stone away before answering. Because, he glanced at the man, wondering if he would explode like Sloan, I found this in the spine, and folks around here don't like that. Murloc gave him a startled look. Do you know why my fellow merchants and I were late this year? Aragon shook his head. Our wanderings have been dogged with misfortune. Chaos seems to rule Allegasia. We could not avoid illness, attacks, and the most cursed black luck. Because the Vardens' attacks have increased, Galbatorix has forced cities to send more soldiers to the borders, men who are needed to combat the Urgles. The brutes have been migrating southeast, towards the Hatterak Desert. No one knows why, and it wouldn't concern us, except they're passing through populated areas. They've been spotted on roads and near cities. Worst of all are reports of a shade, though the stories are uncon unconfirmed. Not many people survive such an encounter. Why haven't we heard of this? cried Aragon. Because, said Murloc grimly, it only began, began a few months ago. Whole villages have been forced to move because Urgles destroyed their fields and starvation threatens. Nonsense, growled Geral. We haven't seen any Urgles. The only one around here is his horns mounted in Morn's tavern. Murloc arched an eyebrow. Maybe so, but this is a small village hidden by the mountains. It's not surprising that you've escaped notice. However, I wouldn't expect that to last. I only mention this because strange things are happening here as well if you've found such a stone in the spine. With that sobering statement, he bid them farewell with a bow and a slight smile. Garrow headed back to Carvajal with Aragon trailing behind. What do you think? asked Aragon. I'm going to get more information before I make up my mind. Take the stone back to the wagon and then do what you want. I'll meet you for dinner at horse. Aragon dodged through the crowd and happily dashed back to the wagon. Trading would take his uncle hours, time that he planned to enjoy fully. He hid the stone under the bags, then set out into town with a cocky stride. He walked from one booth to another, evaluating the goods with a buyer's eye, despite his meager supply of coins. When he talked with the merchants, they confirmed what Murloc had said about the instability in Allegasia. Over and over the message was repeated. 
Last year's security has deserted us. New dangers have appeared, and nothing is safe. Later in the day, he bought three sticks of malt candy and a small, piping hot cherry pie. The hot food felt good after hours of standing in the snow. He licked the sticky stirrup from his fingers regretfully, wishing for more, then sat on the edge of the porch and nibbled a piece of candy. Two boys from Carvajal wrestled nearby, but he felt no inclination to join them. As the day descended into late afternoon, the traders took their businesses business into people's homes. Aragon was impatient for evening, when the troubadours would come out to tell stories and perform trips, tricks. He loved hearing about magic, gods, and, if they were especially lucky, the dragon riders. Carvajal had its own storyteller, Brom, a friend of Aragon's, but his tales grew old over the years, whereas the troubadours always had new ones that he listened to eagerly. Aragon had just broken off an icicle from the underside of the porch when he spotted Sloane nearby. The butcher had not seen him, so Aragon ducked his head and bolted around a corner towards Morn, Morn's tra tavern. The inside was hot and filled with greasy smoke from sputtering tallow candles. The shiny black ergle horns, their twisted span as great as his outstretched arms, were mounted over the door. The bar was long and low, with a stack of staves on one end for customers to carve. Morn tended the bar, his sleeves rolled up to his elbows. The bottom half of his face was short and mashed, as if he rested his chin on a grinding wheel. People crowded solid oak tables and listened to two traders who had finished their business early and had come in for beer. Morn looked up from a mug he was cleaning. Aragon, good to see you. Where's your uncle? Buying, said Aragon with a shrug. He's going to be a while. And Rorn, is he here? asked Morn as he swiped the cloth through another mug. Yes, no sick animals to keep him back this year. Good, good. Aragon gestured at the two traders. Who are they? Grain buyers. They bought everyone's seat at ridiculously low prices, and now they're telling wild stories expecting us to believe them. Aragon understood why Morn was so upset. People need that money. We can't get by without it. What, ki what kind of stories? Morn snorted. They say the Varden have formed a pact with the Urgles and are amassing an army to attack us. Supposedly, it's only through the grace of our king that we've been protected for so long. As if Galbatorix would care if we burned to the ground. Go listen to them. I have enough on my hands without explaining their lies. The first trader filled a chair with his enormous girth, as every movement caused it to protest loudly. There was no hint of hair on his face. His pudgy hands were baby, baby smooth, and he had pouting lips that curled petulantly as he slipped, sipped from a flagon. A second man had a florid face. The skin around his jaw was dry and corpulent, filled with lumps of hard fat like cold butter gone rancid. Contrasted with his neck and jowls, the rest of his body was unnaturally thin. The first trader vainly tried to pull back his expanding borders to fit within the chair. He said, No, no, you don't understand. It's only through the king's unceasing effort on your behalf that you are able to argue with us in safety. If he, in all his wisdom, were to withdraw that sport, so support, woe unto you, someone hollered. Right, or won't you also tell us the riders have returned and you've each killed a hundred elves. Do you think we're children to believe in your tales? We can keep take care of ourselves, the group chuckled. The trader started to reply when his thin companion intervened with a wave of his hand. Gaudy jewels flashed on his fingers. You misunderstand. We know the Empire cannot care for each of us personally, as you may want, but it can keep Urgles and other abominations from un overrunning this, he searched vaguely for the right term, place. The traitor continued, You're angry with the Empire for treating people unfairly. A legitimate concern, but a government cannot please everyone. There will inevitably be con conflicts and arguments. However, the majority of us have nothing to complain about. Every country has some small group of malcontents who are willing aren't who aren't satisfied with the balance of power. Yeah, called a woman. If you're willing to call the Varden small, the fat man sighed. We've already explained that the Varden have no interest in helping you. That's only a falsehood perpetuated by traitors in an attempt to disrupt the empire and convince us that the real threat is inside, not outside our borders. All they want to do is overthrow the king and take possession of our land. They have spies everywhere as they prepare to, prepare to invade. You never know who might be working for them. Aragon did not agree, but the traitor's words were smooth and people were nodding. He stepped forward and said, How do you know this? I can say clouds are green, but that doesn't mean it's true. Prove you aren't lying. 
The two men glared at him while the villagers waited silent for, silently for the answer. The trin, thin traitor spoke first. He avoided Aragon's eyes. Aren't your children taught respect? Or do you let boys challenge men whenever they want to? The listeners fidgeted and stared at Aragon. Then a man said, Answer the question. It's only common sense, said the fat one, sweat beating on his upper lip. His reply riled the villagers, and the dispute resumed. Aragon returned to the bar with a sour taste in his mouth. He had never before met anyone who favored the empire and tore down its enemies. There was a deep-seated hatred of the empire in Carvajal, almost hereditary in nature. The empire never helped them during harsh years when they were nearly starved, and its tax collectors were heartless. He felt justified in disagreeing with the traders regarding the king's mercy, but he did speculate about the Varden. The Varden were a rebel group that constantly raided and attacked the, attacked the empire. It was a mystery who their leader was or who had formed them in the years following Galbatorix's rise to power over a century ago. The group had garnered much sympathy as they eluded Galbatorix's efforts to destroy them. Little was known about the Varden except if you were a fugitive and had to hide, or if you hated the Empire, they would always accept you. The only problem was finding them. Morn leaned over the bar and said, Incredible, isn't it? They're worse than vultures circling a dying animal. There's going to be trouble if they stay much longer. For us or for them? Them, said Morn as angry voices filled the tavern. Aragon left when the argument threatened to become violent. The door thudded shut behind him, cutting off the voices. It was early evening and the sun was sinking rapidly. The houses cast long shadows on the ground. As Aragon headed down the street, he noticed Rorin and Katrina standing in an aisle. Rorin said something Aragon could not hear. Katrina looked down at her hands and answered in an undertone, then leaned up on her tiptoes and kissed him before darting away. Aragon trotted to Rorin and teased, "'Having a good time?' Rorin grunted noncommittally as he paced away. "'Have you heard the traders' news?' asked Aragon, following. Most of the villagers were indoors, talking to traders or waiting until it was dark enough for the troubadours to perform. "'Yes,' Rorin seemed distracted. "'What do you think of Sloane?' "'I thought it was obvious.' There'll be blood between us when he finds about about Katrina and me, stated Rorin. A snowflake landed on Aragon's nose, and he looked up. The sky had turned gray. He could think of nothing appropriate to say. Rorin was right. He clasped his cousin on the shoulder as they continued down by the down the byway. Dinner at Horst's was hearty. The room was full of conversation and laughter. Sweet cordials and heavy ales were consumed in copious amounts, adding to the boisterous atmosphere. When the plates were empty, horse guests left the house and strolled to the field where the traders were camped. A ring of poles topped with candles had been stuck in the ground around a large clearing. Bonfires blazed in the background, painting the ground with dancing shadows. The villagers slowly gathered around the circle and waited expectantly in the cold. The troubadours came tumbling out of their tents, dressed in tasseled clothing, followed by old, older and more stately minstrels. The minstrels provided music and narration as their younger counterparts acted out the stories. The first plays were pure entertainment, body and full of jokes, pratfalls and ridiculous characters. Later, however, when the candles sputtered in their sockets and, out, and everyone was drawn together into a tight circle, the old storyteller Brahm stepped forward. A knotted white beard rippled over his chest and a long black cape wrapped around his bent shoulders, obscuring his body. He spread his arms with hands that reached out like talons and recited thus. The sands of time cannot be stopped. Years pass, whether we will them to or not, but we can remember. What has been lost may yet live on in memories. That you, that which you will hear is imperfect and fragmented, yet treasure it, for without you it does not exist. I give you now a memory that has been forgotten, hidden in the dreamy haze that lies behind us. His keen eyes inspected their interested faces. His gaze lingered on Aragon, last of all. Before your grandfather's fathers were born, and yet, even before their fathers, the dragon riders were formed. To protect and guard was their mission, and for thousands of years they succeeded. Their prowess in battle was unmatched, for each had the strength of ten men. They were immortal unless blade or poison took them. For good only were their powers used, and under their tutelage, tall cities and towers were built out of the living stone. While they kept peace, the land flourished. It was a golden time. 
The elves were our allies, the dwarves our friends. Wealth flowed into our cities, and men prospered. But weep, for it could not last. Brom looked down silently. Infinite sadness resonated in his voice. Though no enemy could destroy them, they could not guard against themselves. And it came to pass at the height of their power that a boy, Galbatorix by name, was born in the province of Inzilbeth, which is no more. At ten he was tested, as was the custom, and it was found that great power resided in him. The riders accepted him, in, accepted him as, as their own. Through their training he passed, exciting all others in skill. Gifted with a sharp mind and strong body, he quickly took his place among the riders' ranks. Some saw his abrupt rise as dangerous and warned the others, but the riders had grown arrogant in their power and ignored caution. Alas, sorrow was conceived that day. So it was that soon after his training was finished, Gabatorix took a reckless trip with two friends. Far north they flew, night and day, and passed into the Urgle's remaining territory, foolishly thinking their new powers would protect them. There, on a thick sheet of ice, unmelted even in summer, they were ambushed in their sleep. Though his friends and their dragons were butchered and he suffered great wounds, Galbatorix slew his attackers. Tragically, during the fight, a stray arrow pierced his dragon's heart. Without the arch to save her, she died in his arms. Then were the seeds of madness planted. The storyteller clasped his hands and looked around slowly, shadows flickering across his worn face. The next words came like the mournful toll of a requiem. Alone, barefoot of much of his strength and half mad with loss, Gabatorx wandered without hope in that desolate land, seeking death. It did not come to him, though he threw himself without fear against any living thing. Urgles and other monsters soon fled from his haunted form. During this time, he came to realize that the riders might grant him another dragon. Driven by this thought, he began the arduous journey, on foot, back through the spine. Territory he had soared over effortlessly on a dragon's back, now it took him months to traverse. He could hunt with magic, but oftentimes he walked in places where the animals did not travel. Thus, when his feet finally left the mountains, he was close to death. A farmer found him collapsed in the mud and summoned the riders. Unconscious, he was taken to their holdings, and his body healed. He slept for four days. Upon awakening, he gave no sign of his fevered mind. When he was brought before a council convened to judge him, Gabatorix demanded another dragon. The desperation of the request revealed his dementia, and the council saw him for what he truly was. Denied his hope, Galbatorix, through the twisted mirror of his madness, came to believe it was the rider's fault his dragon had died. Night after night he brooded on that and formulated a plan to exact revenge. Brahm's words dropped to a mesmerizing whisper. He found a sympathetic riser, rider, and there his insidious words took root. By persistent reasoning and the use of dark secrets learned from a shade, he inflamed the rider against their elders. Together they treacherously lured and killed an elder. When the foul deed was done, Galbatorix turned on his ally and slaughtered him without warning. The riders found him, then, with blood dripping from his hands. A scream tore from his lips, and he fled into the night. As he was cunning in his madness, they could not find him. For years he hid in wastelands like a hunted animal, always watching for pursuers. His atrocity was not forgotten, but over time searches ceased. Then, through some ill fortune, he met a young rider, Morzan, strong of body but weak of mind. Galbatorix convinced Morzan to leave a gate unbolted in the city Ilria, which is now called Urbane. Through this gate, Galbatorix entered and stored, dra stole a dragon hatchling. He and his new disciple hid themselves in an evil place where the riders dared not venture. There, Morzan entered in a dark apprenticeship learning secrets and forbidden magic that should never have been revealed. When his instruction was finished and Galbatorix's black dragon, Shrukan, was fully grown, Galbatorix revealed himself to the world with Morzan at his side. Together they fought any rider they met. With each kill their strength grew. Twelve of the riders joined Galbatorix out of desire for power and revenge against perceived wrongs. Those twelve, with Morzan, became the thirteen forsworn, the riders were unprepared and fell beneath the onslaught. 
The elves, too, fought bitterly against Galbatorix, but they were overthrown and forced to flee to their secret places from whence they come no more. Only Vrail, leader of the riders, could resist Galbatorix and the Forsworn. Ancient and wise, he struggled to save what he could and keep the remaining dragons from falling to his enemies. In the last battle, before the gates of Doru Arabea, Vrail defeated Galbatorix, but hesitated with the final blow. Galbatorix seized the moment and smote him in the side. Grievously wounded, Vrail f fled to Utgard Mountain, where he hoped to gather strength. But it was not to be, for Galbatorix found him. As they fought, Galbatorix kicked, kicked Vrail in the fork of his legs. With that underhanded blow, he gained dominance over Vrail and removed his head with a blazing sword. Then, as power rushed through his veins, Galbatorix anointed himself king over all Allegasia. And then from that day, he has ruled us. With the completion of the story, Brahm shuffled away with the troubadours. Aragon thought he saw a tear shining on his cheek. People murmured quietly to each other as they departed. Garrow said to Aragon and Rorin, "'Consider yourselves fortunate. I have only heard this tale twice in my life. If the Empire knew that Brahm had recited it, he would not live to see a new month.'" The evening after their return from Carvajal, Aragon decided to test the stone as Murloc had. Alone in his room, he set it on his bed and laid three tools next to it. He started with a wooden mallet and lightly tapped the stone. It produced a subtle ringing. Satisfied, he picked up the next tool, a heavy leather hammer. A mournful peal reverberated when it struck. Lastly, he pounded a small chisel against it. The metal did not chip or scratch the stone, but it produced the clearest sound yet. As the final note died away, he thought he heard a faint squeak. Murloc said the stone was hollow. There could be something of value inside. I don't know how to open it, though. There must have been good reason for someone to shape it, but whoever sent the stone into the spine hasn't taken the trouble to retrieve it or don't know where it is. But I don't believe that a magician with enough power to transport the stone wouldn't be able to find it again. So was, was I meant to have it? He could not answer the question. Resigned to an unsolvable mystery, he picked up the tools and returned the stone to its shelf. That night, he was abruptly roused from sleep. He listened carefully. All was quiet. Uneasy, he slid his hand under the mattress and grasped his knife. He waited a few minutes, then slowly sank back to sleep. A squeak pierced the silence, tearing him back to wakefulness. He rolled out of bed and yanked the knife from its sheath. Fumbling with a tinderbox, he lit a candle. The door to his room was closed. Though the squeak was too loud to be a mouse or a rat, he still checked under the bed. Nothing. He sat on the edge of the mattress and rubbed the sleep from his eyes. Another squeak filled, filled the air, and he started violently. Where was the noise coming from? Nothing could be in the floor or walls. They were solid wood. The same went for his bed, and he wouldn't have noticed if anything had crawled into a straw mattress during the night. His eyes settled on the stone. He took it off the shelf and absently created it, cradled it as he studied the room. A squeak rang in his ears and reverberated through his fingers. It came from the stone. The stone had given him nothing but frustration and anger, and now it would not even let him sleep. It ignored his furious glare and sat solidly, occasionally peeping. Then it gave one very loud squeak and fell silent. Aragon morally put it away and got back under the sheets. Whatever secret the stone held, it would have to wait until morning. The moon was shining through the window when he woke again. The stone was rocking on the sh rapidly on the shelf, knocking against the wall. It was bathed in cool moonlight that bleached its surface. Aragon jumped out of bed, knife in hand. The motion stopped, but he remained tense. Then the stone started squeaking and ro rocking faster than ever. With an oath, he began, began dressing. He did not care how valuable the stone might be. He was going to take it far away and bury it. The rocking stopped. The stone became quiet. It quivered, then rolled forward and dropped onto the floor with a loud thump. He inched toward the door in alarm as the stone wobbled toward him. Suddenly, a crack appeared on the stone. Then another, and another. Transfixed, Aragon leaned forward, still holding the knife. At the top of the stone, where all the cracks met, a small piece wobbled, as if it were balanced on something, then rose and toppled to the floor. Another series of squeaks, a small dark head, after, a small, after another series of squeaks, a small dark head poked out of the hole, followed by a weirdly angled body. 
Aragon gripped the knife tighter and held very still. Soon the creature was all the way out of the stone. It stayed in place for a moment and skittered into the moonlight. Aragon recoiled in shock, standing in front of him, looking off the membrane that encased it was a dragon. <laughs>